One night in 2005, a little skinny Scottish lad was plonked down in front of a television with some microwave pizza to watch a brand new episode of a very old show. That show was Doctor Who and that little pizza filled cherub was me. After that night, everything changed. Doctor Who changed my life. I knew what I was going to do with my life. I didn't necessarily know how I would get there, but I knew where I was going. Fast forward nearly 15 years later and that little skinny Scottish lad isn't so different except not so little and definitely not so skinny. Everything I'm doing now is because of Doctor Who and what it taught me about writing and creativity and telling stories. I'm proud to be a Doctor Who fan, but oh my god, I haven't seen the classic stuff. Now that's a bit of a lie, I have seen some of the classic series. I've seen at least a snippet of every Doctor in action, but I still feel like I'm missing a lot of the puzzle. So I figured it's about time I did something about that, and we're about to start then the beginning. This series is going to be part review, part live commentary. I want to watch and review everything, and if that sounds like something you want to follow along with, then hop on and come up, come along. I don't know. Let's get started with episode one, An Unearthly Child. Okay, here we go. It's going to be a long, long journey. <laughs> There's the TARDIS. That has got to be one of the best things about the show, isn't it? Is that, like, over the course of 50, well, more than 50 years now, they haven't changed that design, other than, like, those small little bits in here, like the windows and the sign and all that. But it's still a fucking police box. I feel like you don't need to have seen any of the classic episodes at all to know this imagery. The old police box in the junkyard. Even by today's standards, they do such a good job of establishing the atmosphere. One of the greatest things about modern Doctor Who is how colourful and deep the visuals are, but there's something to be said about how the black and white is used in this first episode. It doesn't feel dated, it feels part of it. The way the TARDIS is sitting in the shadows and the policeman walking through the fog. Every part of it sells the mystery of the show right from the moment that iconic theme begins to play. And then we're introduced to the characters. Barbara! Ian! The whole gang. Thank you for the wee. I say thank you for the wee. But the wee wasn't invented for years. I'm led to believe this is what people did in the 60s. Um, kids, anyway. Not a lot has changed, obviously. Um, we still stand around and do some hand movements to the latest, uh, the latest jive. <laughs> With a plotline that could only exist in an innocent 1960s science fiction, two older school teachers decide to follow a young girl home. But this isn't your ordinary run-of-the-mill girl, she's a bit odd. Of course the decimal system hasn't started yet. Oh Susan, you were dropping the ball somewhat here. That is a, that's one of my favourite time travel movie TV show tropes, is when they just start blurring out things about the future, as if they can't control it. But you, you're gonna be mayor! I, I mean, uh, it is so good, like it's such a strange, weird amalgamation of ideas. I mean, it's clearly worked, because it stood the test of time. And obviously at this point they don't have the concept of regeneration or any of that thing that kept it going so long. But all the components are there, and it's just like, it's so weird that it's just the exact same show. There's not really a lot you can criticize either, because all the things that are slightly awkward and slightly like, not quite up to scratch, in these earlier episodes are because it's of the time and because they had such a low budget. Some of the acting's not great, but you know, it was uh, a different time. I just also just talked over the introduction of the Doctor there, so... Here's the Doctor. William Hartnell is so great. I feel like it can be quite easy to stereotype his Doctor as a strict, jittery old man, but even in this first episode when it maybe wasn't quite as set in stone just what his character was going to be, he still gives such a layered performance. He's hostile and quick to anger, but he's witty and cunning and absolutely in charge and absolutely the Doctor. I think it was like last year I started watching William Hartnell's episodes. And he's so good. He's so good in it. Like this whole bit is so good. Just like when the camera stays on him and you see his little face going like, mm, I'm gonna fuck with these people. <laughs> Who's looking at us? <gasps> the TARDIS. Why, it's bigger on the inside. Do they say that in this episode? I, I, I hope they do. Shut the train off early. Another one of those ideas that was so crazy it just might work. Our first step into the best vehicle in all of film and television. Suck it, Enterprise. Although I guess the DeLorean's pretty cool. And the Batmobile. Come to think of it, what I wouldn't give for one of those Jurassic Park Land Rovers. Whatever the point is, this is the, it's the mother flipping TARDIS, alright? But it's not quite the TARDIS we know and love, and that's one of the things I love most about watching these earlier episodes, is seeing how these ideas develop over the years into what we know now. When we first see it, the TARDIS is pretty dangerous. I can't his life! Oh god. The TARDIS doesn't do that these days. <laughs> it's all telepathic circuits and come on in. He does essentially kidnap these two people, doesn't he? 
I only take the best, <laughs> like Rose. Just kidding, sometimes I kidnap people and force them to come with me. Whoa. Oh. That has got to be one of the best sound effects ever made for anything. The, on, um, when Rose first aired, the first 2005 episode, um, I was 10 years old. The tar the sound of the TARDIS is literally what, what made me want to watch more. Obviously the show was amazing and I loved it, but like, the sound of the TARDIS, I don't know why, it was just like... It's such a good sound effect. And a first Doctor Who cliffhanger comes with an ominous shadow looming across a desolate landscape towards the TARDIS. Who are they? What does it mean? Will they ever- Oh god, it's the fucking caveman episode next, isn't it? Our first trip away in the TARDIS comes in the form of a three-part story, starting with the Cave of Skulls. And you know, things... things take a turn. Here we go, episode two. Again, I have seen this episode before. Um and I wasn't crazy about it. The story itself is fine. I think they had to do something like this in their first proper outing, given that the main idea behind the show seemed to be leaning more towards educational content for kids. And the first thing they would want to do as a show is stretch their legs and show off their lack of limitations in terms of time and place. So you either go forwards in time or backwards. They chose backwards and it's, it's, you know, it's fine. I have the exact same reaction whenever I rub my bone. It's pretty good for a soundstage, isn't it, though? You hear all the stories of them having such low budget and having to work on the crappiest sound stages. It's not a bad set. It looks like real sand and real rock <laughs> on an alien world. So the Doctor goes off to do his Doctor things and lights up his pipe. You know how the Doctor is, the oncoming bronchite, as he is to his mates. A friendly neighborhood caveman sees him make fire from his finger, so does the only rational thing and kidnaps him. Oh, God gonna King Kong him. My creature, I make fire come from his fingers. So can I, mate. Give me a match and a can of links and I'll do the same. So Cal the Caveman wants to be leader of the tribe on account of having the ability to make fire, or at least an old man to do it for him. Typical politician, eh? <laughs> or something like that, I can do political satire. But Zah the Caveman also wants to be leader, but can he make fire? Can he bollocks? And the conflict just escalates from here on out and it's, you know, it's, it's fine. I mean, all the actors are very good. Considering what they're having to do, they're dressed in rags on a BBC Seven stage. But I buy that they're cavemen, you know. Oh, get to the Daleks already! Come on. Ian, Barbara, and Susan the Howler Monkey arrive to try and free the Doctor. Yes, Susan. <laughs> oh, it's mental. It's a riot in here. It's off the chain. But they get thrown into the aptly named Cave of Skulls. And sure, it's all the drama and high stakes you could ask for, but I just want to know when they're going to address the mystery of who Many Men is. I was a great leader of Many Men. Many Men. Many Men. Who is Many Men? Zah will be a strong leader of Many Men. Many Men is dead. I told you this. Episode 3 kicks off with a solid bang, and we see elderly female cave women sneaking about and taking what I would eventually learn was a knife. What the fuck is that? Oh, it's a rock. I thought... I thought it was food. Back with the Doctor and co, they're still struggling to find a means of escape from the dark, dingy, and just downright spooky Cave of Skulls. I wonder why they call it the Cave of Skulls. <laughs> what do you think, Susan? Was it the Cave of Skulls before the um, skulls were put in there? Or did it become the Cave of Skulls because there were skulls in the cave? That's, that's the real mystery of the episode. <laughs> With the help of elderly cavewoman Samantha Rockwell, the gang make a hasty escape into the jungle. Much to the obvious outrage of, um, uh, Za and her. Yep. The gang race through the jungle until they find the remains of an unfortunate boar that was killed by something huge. Is that Pumba? From Cult Classic The Lion King? Cult classic? How's that a cult classic? I'm an idiot, I'm sorry. Za and her pursue until Za is attacked by the monster, or her, or it's one of them. This is the last of its day. And what about your woman? We'll cut our he is so much of a dick in these earlier episodes. <laughs> I guess it is development because at this point he hasn't really travelled with humans before, has he? So, I suppose over the course of 50 years of travelling with different people, he gets humanised a bit. I can't remember what's happening. I can't remember who's who. I don't feel like I'm just being like, oh, this is so boring compared to the modern stuff. Because loads of the episodes, um, last time I watched some of the classic ones, I loved, like in this series, um, I loved the Dalek one coming up. I loved the Sensorites, I thought they were really cool. But this, uh, these cavemen ones are just so boring. 
The story just feels very slow. Maybe you have to be in the right mood for it, and I think it's undeniable that a lot of creativity and planning went into it. I think where it falls down is that even compared to the other classic episodes in the series, it never feels particularly engaging for the audience. Most of the time the characters just say how they feel, if you can call that talking. It has a lot of potential, it has great set design, and the acting is generally okay, but you can feel that the show hasn't quite found its feet yet, and that's fine, it's really no rush. The injured Zah is taken back to the TARDIS to be healed, while back at Caveland, Cal has killed the elderly cavewoman and pinned it on Zah, and he's out for blood. The Doctor and the gang reach the TARDIS, but is that a cliffhanger I smell? The TARDIS. The TARDIS. Oh no. Gypsies. Oh sh shit. Episode 4 kicks off and by this point my brain just isn't cutting it. Okay, episode 4. Here we go. One last more. One last more? Episode 4. I can't. Rhymes speaking. I've been mean, listening to fucking cavemen for too long, that's an issue. The Doctor and the gang are brought back to the base camp, where they turn the tables on Cal and get him cast out of the whole rocky gang. Zha wakes up and orders them to be sent back into the Cave of Skulls. I mean, what's the point of having a Cave of Skulls if you're not going to use it, do you know what I mean? But at this point, I'm so disengaged from the story, I'm starting to notice the most nonsensical bullshit. That's the exact same music sting when Captain America catches the hammer in Endgame. <laughs> it's not. Is really not. While Ian takes on the role of Twisted Firestarter in the hope that the gift of fire will buy their freedom, Cal sneaks his way back into the cave to confront Zah, and oh boy does he confront Zah. If it's confront Zah you're after, then oh my friend, confront Zah is just what you'll get. The only thing on the menu tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a hot steamy bowl of confronting Zah with a side order of Zah confrontation. Oh shit, the final battle. It's Luke versus Vader all over again. Oh, this is pretty cool. I remember the sequence actually. It feels very weirdly lit and not consistent with the rest of the episode, <laughs> but it's a cool sequence. Look at these close-ups. Can Damien Chazelle direct this? Jesus. With Cal defeated and fire at his disposal, Zah is officially back on top. While maddeningly dizzy with power, Zah heads out into the jungle to bring back some mystery meats for his buddies. Back in their goddamn cave of skulls, Barbara ponders over their survival being down to wherever Fa is. We wouldn't be if we hadn't given them fire. Fire. If we hadn't given them far. Susan devises a way they can escape by creating a ghoulish distraction that will give them enough time to slip away and get back to the TARDIS. Is that Nicholas Cage? Even if they constructed a whole skeleton puppet out of every bone. <laughs> it's like the size of the room. Oh my god, Ian, you're good. It doesn't take long for the cave people to realize the truth and then the chase is on. Leave her! <laughs> There's no time! Oh, I remember this scene. Just smacking the actors in the faces with leaves. They make it back inside the TARDIS and don't waste any time in cheesing it out of there. Pump the gas! Floor it! I wish the TARDIS had a tire screeching sound. They escape just in the nick of time, but the TARDIS is acting a little bit iffy. With no data to plot a course back to Ian and Barbara's time, the TARDIS ends up in a mysterious jungle with strange alien trees. Now you're talking. As the gang head out to investigate, they don't notice that the radiation detector starts to climb and tip into the danger zone. And this is where we leave an unearthly child. This collection of episodes is truly something special. It's the introduction into a world that will always be expanding and always be evolving, and it's the start of a long, long journey. A lot of the elements of these first stories are clumsy and very dated, but what's clear even all these years later is how much passion and imagination the creators of the show put into every scene. The three cavemen episodes are certainly not my favourite, but that could just be because of how effective and engaging the previous episode is, and the mysterious elements of the show that it introduces feel so much more intriguing in that first story. Any worries I would ordinarily have about the audience being put off by, in my opinion, a much slower second story story of the entire show are obviously pretty much put to bed by the fact that 56 years later, people are still looking back and watching where this timeless worldwide legacy first started. It's maybe unfair to expect a show as bizarre and experimental as Doctor Who to hit the ground running and be as brilliant as I always hoped it would be right from the start, but I cannot wait to see what else they do and where they go next, as long as that fucking bird doesn't come too. Oh, this bird is driving me mental. It's the same bird sound effect just over and over. And this bird, if this bird doesn't stop, I'm gonna... I mean, there's nothing I can do.